In real life, death can be a bummer. But in the lands between, death is weird, man. Last time we discussed the recurring motif of dragons and trees transforming into one another, and in that video I briefly discussed destined death and its effect of turning things into trees. Well today we're going to take that idea and run with it. While destined death does seem to be a necessary component in the creation of the great tree, there's just so much more to it than that. Another thing we'll be exploring is the many instances of decapitation in the game, which seem to symbolically link back to destined death. The mausoleum knights are headless knights watching over the remains of headless demigods, for example, and it just keeps going on and on from there. At the end of all this, we'll see that death is not merely the end of things, but rather a form of spiritual ascension. So let's make like trees and cut our own heads off. One of the most common sources of lore on these ritual sacrifices is weapons, because there are a lot that mention being used for some ritual purpose. The Glintstone Crease to start with mentions being used in rituals, but doesn't go on to elaborate what those rituals were. There are only so many rituals that demand a ceremonial dagger, though, so we can safely assume it was some sort of sacrifice. The Celebrant weapons also mention being used for ceremonial purposes without specifying what those could be, though we can guess that it likely involves offering skins to the nearby Godskin Apostle. Furthermore, their weapon set also includes a head, which certainly tells us decapitation is happening somewhere. But all of this is just establishing the theme of human sacrifice in Elden Ring. What's the good stuff? First we've got the Rosa's Axe. Again, there's mention of rituals without any clarification as to what those rituals were, but unless we're ceremonially cutting down trees, we can probably guess. It's also our first direct connection between ritual sacrifice and death. Perhaps Rosa's duty of guiding the dead involved sacrificing them first. Our next connection comes from the Sacrificial Axe, which is the most upfront name we'll see in the whole video. Again, the description plays coy with what these rituals even were to begin with, but it's at least straightforward enough to know A, it involves ritual sacrifice, and B, it's thematically connected to destined death through the association with the Deathbirds. Interestingly, the Deathbird is called out as being malevolent. This could mean that it was crafted after the demonization of the Deathbirds. The word ancient is infuriatingly vague for a game with lore that goes as deep as Elden Rings. But if it was crafted even longer ago, it could imply that those who wielded it before the Golden Order didn't care for the Deathbirds either. Quite an interesting example is the Executioner's Great Axe, which mentions felling enemy soldiers like timber. This might sound like an odd bit of poetic liberty on the part of the translators, but in fact this allusion to trees exists in the Japanese as well. So now we're getting somewhere. An axe wielded by those who live in death, whose victims are compared to trees? Let's continue. And quick aside, I do not speak Japanese. I took three semesters of it in college. Fuck, that was almost a decade ago. But I know enough about the language to know how it works, and I know the limits of Google Translate, and I'm I'm trying my best. You find a similar thing going on with the winged greathorn. The English description compares them to envoy's wings, which might tempt us to compare them to the death birds, who were led by an entity called the twin bird, who was also called an envoy. In the Japanese, however, it's not so clear cut. The wings of the greathorn are called Mitsukai's wings, which is the Japanese term for the angels of Christianity. The term consists of o here pronounced mi, an honorific prefix denoting great reverence, and tsukao, which means messenger. The twin bird, meanwhile, is only referred to as tsukao. So that might mean that these two item descriptions are referring to different ideas in English and Japanese. Fret not, however, because the description of this weird-ass weapon continues. In both English and Japanese, it says they are made to reap the lives of those who do not experience budding. Once again, we have plant puns being used in an item description involving ritual sacrifice. And if what I'm suggesting about ritual sacrifices and the powers of death and death are true, then we can see how a ritual like this may have gotten started. After all, if cutting someone's head off turns them into a tree, then logically that is what you would do if something or someone failed to properly sprout. Whew, that was a lot. Is there more? You bet your happy ass there's more. The Serpent God Curved Sword is a fun one. It has no direct connections with destined death that we can see, and based on its description alone, it doesn't even mention beheading. But if you, like me, hadn't ever really noticed, then look at this image from the opening cutscene again. Rykard's head has been removed and served to Iglae on some sort of platter, so it would seem that offerings to the Great Serpent are first ceremonially decapitated, likely with this weapon. And we know from Rykard's boss fight what the end result of this decapitation is. Rykard does not die but instead takes on a new form of life, combined with another being. 
So no, this weapon is not technically connected to Death and Death, but it still mimics Death's methods of ascension through sacrifice. That theme is carried over in our last two weapons, the Cranial Vessel Candle Stand and St. Trina's Torch. The Candle Stand tells us that Barak was a fire monk who grew concerned with a lackadaisical commitment to protecting the fire that his fellows had, so naturally he did the only reasonable thing and took his own head off about it. That's all context though. If you look at the weapon itself, it tells a subtly different story. The weapon shows us a decapitated head full of fire, and if you look closely, you can see a third eye engraved on the forehead. The language, I think, is pretty clear. Through beheading, Barak has opened his third eye and attained magical fire. In other words, he has ascended. St. Trina's torch, while having no mention of ritual sacrifices of any kind, depicts the exact same idea. The head of an individual, filled with flame, with their third eye wide open. These two are fun because they're so far removed from Destined Death in context that it might come as a shock, but they hold up as parallels. While they still have a head on their shoulders, their item description states that the skull and brain has been completely replaced by Glintstone. But despite losing their heads, they have still attained spiritual ascension by peering into the primeval current and obtaining the most powerful and ancient sorceries. And if you squint a little and huff some glue, you can see that their state is pretty similar to that of Godwin. All three of them have obtained some great power, but at the cost of their identity and becoming completely inert. Fun fact! Marai is French for marsh. How is that relevant? House Marai is one of the few noble houses we meet in the game. While mostly seen as a house of executioners, the official set lays out all their duties in their entirety. Surveillance, executions, and gruesome rituals. While it's an open question what surveillance might refer to, I think, given everything else we've discussed, that the executions and gruesome rituals of House Marai may have been one and the same. Another interesting thing to note is the name of House Marai's current patriarch, Mali Marai. Firstly, Mali contains the same Mal root as Millennia, which makes sense considering his connection with her. However, and this is just a shot in the dark, Mali is pronounced the same as Mali, and I believe it may just be a fantastical respelling of Mali. And Molly comes from Mall, which is just another name for Mary. Merica is also cognate with Mary. So his parallels may go both ways? And then there's the matter of the Scarlet Rod itself. I hope to have another video one day to really dive into the parallels, so for now I'll keep it brief. Destined Death and the Scarlet Rod are both very close parallels to one another. The Halig Tree is a holy tree housing a demigod with Scarlet Rod underneath it, just as the Erd Tree is a holy tree housing a demigod with destined death underneath it, for example. House Marai, following all the symbolism of destined death while allying themselves with the Scarlet Rot, is just another example of that parallel. These guys are coming in close to the end because they're so upfront with everything, there's hardly anything to say about them besides summarizing what we already know, which is. The Mausoleum Knights underwent ritual sacrifice and cut their own heads off so they could continue serving their headless demigods. But what's interesting to me is the demigods themselves in their wandering mausoleum, because I think the image of them conveys a hefty bit of symbolism. If what I'm suggesting about destined death actually being some form of spiritual ascension is correct, what clearer way to illustrate that concept than a headless corpse wearing a crown? Shoutouts to my wife for this one. Love you, boo. Ever notice how all the statues in the Dragon Communion churches have their heads knocked off? Like, all of them. What's up with that? That's the question I asked my wife, trying to get a fresh set of eyes on the problem from someone who's never even played the game before. And she had the following observation. Kinda looks like the final boss, doesn't it? And yeah, it does. The Elden Beast looks like a headless dragon. And once you have this little insight, you start seeing headless dragons in other places too. Godric the Grafted beheads a dragon in order to graft its head onto his arm, and its headless body will remain there for the rest of the game, strung up like it's in a tree. The Dragon Church in Fromazula has a dragon's head hanging above the altar, and this setup is mirrored in the Church of Iglai. It's a snake and not a dragon, but it still counts. And it's not an actual head, it's just a shed skin, but it still counts. If you watched my last video, watch it. You remember how the Elden Beast fits into the archetype of dragons turned trees. And now with this piece, we finally have a mechanism for how that could have happened. If what I'm proposing is correct, that the ancient Crucible of Life was in fact originally a dragon, then turning it into the Great Tree would have involved ritually beheading that dragon and using the powers of destined death. Now that we've discussed the Elden Beast, let's take a look at good old Godwin, our principal figure of destined death. I have two proposals I'd like to discuss. 
Firstly, not only was a ritual involved in creating the Black Knives that would slay Godwin, but the entire affair may have been some sort of ritual sacrifice. And secondly, we should think of Godwin in his current state, sad and undesirable though it may be, as some form of ascension. What exactly it is he is ascending to is still a mystery, but given the obscure nature of the Eclipse and the many characters who lament being unable to bring Godwin back, I suspect that his resurrection, should it ever happen, will confer upon him some great new powers. After all, you can hardly walk into the realm of death and back out again without some sort of magical enhancement. But Godwin is a parallel to Merica after all, and indeed I believe we should see Merica's state as a form of ascension as well. The position she finds herself in, crucified to a rune arc with some sort of spear piercing her, is a dead ringer for this image of Odin hanging himself from the world tree Yggdrasil. Odin did this thing as a sacrifice, a sacrifice to himself, mind you, so that he might obtain the runes that were so important for weaving spells and controlling the physical forces of the world. Merica is hanged in a tree instead of on a tree, but the symbolism stands. This state is Queen Merica's ascension. Ritual sacrifice is all over the lands between, and given all the parallels these various practices have, it suggests to me that they're all based on some older, more magical practice that was carried on throughout the generations even as its original meaning was lost. World building parallels like these are such a great way to offer lore hints and breadcrumbs to your audience without having to exposit a thing. Next time, we leapfrog off of what we've talked about in our last two episodes and tackle the parallels of lions and the solar eclipse. So if you're feeling brave, stay tuned.